Welcome to the Mango Effect podcast, where every week we talk about the path to living a limitless life and having the freedom to do it your way. No topics are off limits. We get into the practical, the hypothetical, and the downright juicy stuff. I'm Mindy Rosser, your host and lifestyle cheerleader, and I'm here today to talk about why we need to screw the fluff and take a no BS approach to work and life. So you're thinking, Mindy, what the heck are we talking about today? So have you ever felt compelled to make something fluffy, kind of like fluff it up, because someone told you to? Or maybe there are expectations around what you should do because everyone else is doing it. There is something that really gets me irritated. And it is when I feel like I have to do something that is unnecessary work. You know what I'm talking about? The boss gives you a project and you're like, this is complete busy work. This is never going to get used. Or, you know, those reports that you have to do that no one ever looks at. You know, so for me, it's all about trying to strip away the fluff. And as a business owner, it is really important for me to be able to identify when there is something that is a little bit fluffy to actually remove from the process. If it's not being used, why are we doing it? And sometimes we feel this pressure that we actually have to do it because that's what everyone else does, or that's what my clients expect, or that's what, for some reason, somebody somewhere somehow told me I had to do this. And you don't. You actually get to make the rules. You get to choose what is fluff and what is actually meaningful. And I think when we understand that we are in the driver's seat and that we have the power to determine what is unnecessary and what is actually integral to our process, that's when we are empowered. And I want to talk a little bit more and go a little deeper in this today because it has been a topic that's come up, come up for me quite recently. So I brought on a new client. She is amazing. I really, really like working with her. And so in the back of my head, I thought, you know, maybe I should create this like crazy, beautiful strategy document to talk about the work I'm going to be doing and just put it in this beautiful presentation and it would just be incredible, right? So in the past, I have partnered with people that that is the approach that they took and they had like 20, 30 page, you know, PDF or Google Slides document that was just gorgeous. I mean, it was the most beautifully designed thing you'd ever seen. It looks like you've been incredibly thoughtful. There's graphs and pictures and images and all your brand colors. There's links to all kinds of documents and it is just gorgeous. So I was looking at all the templates that I have accumulated over the years because I have a lot of them after being in my business for like 10, 12 years. You accumulate a lot. And I was like, okay, so maybe I can pull from this strategy and maybe this document is pretty cool. Ooh, I like the stylistic elements here. And I realized I spent about 15, 20 minutes going down this path of, okay, I'm going to create this beautiful strategy document. And I thought, you know what? Stop, Mindy, stop. (laughs) I talked to myself in the third person. Is this document, once it's looked at, like we may look at it on a strategy call, and once it's looked at, is it ever going to get looked at again? Is anyone ever going to reference this document? And I had to be honest with myself in that moment and say, you know what? Nobody is going to look at this again. Is the client actually going to care that I created this strategy document to, first of all, you know, justify what I am worth, what she's paying me. It doesn't even matter. Are we going to get to results faster if I actually say, no, let's just create the actual implementation documents, get that all up and running. And that is the strategy. Here are the links to all the documents that we're actually using to implement the plan. Here's why. Boom, done. And so that was a moment where I had to really make a good decision on what would work for my client. Now, if my client was really into beautiful strategy documents, I might have chosen a different path, but she's not. She really wants to like get going. Like, Mindy, how fast can we get this thing off the ground? How quickly can you make profile edits? How soon can we get messages and find the right people so I can grow my network? So to her, I know that that's what's meaningful to her. So it doesn't make sense for me to make this beautiful strategy document just because most people in my space make a beautiful strategy document and spend all this time that I could be implementing. You know, it's going to take me a week or two to put that strategy document together and make it look pretty. Or should I just start implementing? You know, and it's really thinking through your process and making these decisions. It's one example. So, of course, I optimate, optim, I can't talk. I opted for the actual implementation and just went with 
the documents and I said, here's an overview video. This is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And here are all the documents that we need to actually make it happen. And that was sufficient. Like She was stoked. She was happy. She's like, great. How fast can we go? I'm like, right now, I'm working on your profile tomorrow. Let's do this. So I think it's really funny because sometimes we get stuck in our heads and it doesn't have to be a strategy document for you. It may be something completely different, but there's something fluffy that just makes you crazy, right? When you think about that fluffy something, why do I have to do this task? And you know what comes to mind for me, too, is do you remember in high school when you had to write essays? And Okay, I'm raising my hand. You can't see it. I wrote a lot of essays in high school, and you get really good at snowballing. So that's what we would call it. You just add all kinds of fluff because it has to be, you know, 300, 500, 1,000 words, whatever it is for you, and you just fluff it all up. So, like, there's one little concept, and you try to add as much verbiage around it just to make word count. And that's what we don't want to do. We want to make sure that it is as distilled and as streamlined as possible because that's what makes an awesome life. This can also be applied to the way that we live our lives. Like how much fluff do you have in your day? And when I'm talking about fluff, you get to define fluff, not what I consider fluff, not what Susie considers fluff, not what Joe considers fluff. What do you consider fluff in your lifestyle, in your days? Like for me, you know, stuff that just uh, I feel like is incredibly fluffy at this point. You know, it just depends at this point, like cleaning the house and making sure it's 100 percent perfect all the time. Is fluffy work for me. That is not the best use of my time. I live in a beach house. We get like sand blowing in and dust. Like it's crazy. I I have never experienced it quite in this way until we moved here to Hawaii, like living in the Midwest. Things would get dirty, but you could kind of let it go for a week or two here. It's like one day and you have all kinds of sand in your house from who knows where. And so for me, I had to learn to let go of that fluff in cleaning the house because it's really easy for me to say, well, the house is dirty, procrastinate on the tasks that really are meaningful to me that will actually move me closer towards my goals and focus on cleaning the house. Now, I enjoy cleaning the house. I do it for a break, but I think there's a really good balance there where it's really easy to get obsessed with all of these fluffy things. And when we look at our days and we get to the end of our days and we go, I don't know what I did today. I really don't like you. You would ask me, I don't have no idea what I did today. But when you get to the end of your days and you're like, I've got a list, like I can show you my list right now of all the things that I did today and they were all intentionally chosen and they were not fluffy tasks. And so the better you can get at making your days flow and making sure that they are not fluffy and filled with tasks that you don't like to do and you get to find what fluff is, remember, the happier you're going to be as a human and We just don't talk about this, you know. There's some fluffy things that we just absolutely have to do, but it's worth asking the question. When you're getting ready to do a task, especially if you have that feeling of, oh, I have to do this again. Oh, my gosh. Like, when you have that feeling, pay attention. Listen to your intuition. Is that telling you, like, hey, maybe I can make this faster, easier, more efficient, more effective. Do I have to do this? Can I just cut it out altogether? Would anyone notice? Would anyone care? And as a business person, as somebody who is also pushing forward in your career, this is how you move up the ladder. You learn how to cut the fluff. You learn how to make processes and people and projects move more smoothly and everyone's working together better. So you are learning how to do this and implementing the same approach to how you work your way up through the ranks or how you grow your business to your life is really cool. Like, why don't we apply that same process to our life? For me, fluffy things that I don't enjoy doing, going to like gatherings that are not meaningful. If it's not a very close friend or my family, I am not game. I am not excited about meeting strangers around topics I don't care about or just having a barbecue because, you know, it's Friday night and it's 6 p.m. and why not have a barbecue, right? For me, that's a fluffy use of time. And so really understanding what light you up and what feels like this is fluffy get rid of the fluff and do the stuff that makes you happy the stuff that actually moves you forward now everything isn't going to make you happy I, I don't feel like all warm and fuzzy inside every single time I sit down to do like client work and write a LinkedIn profile or you know put together some deliverables for a client or work on a program or record a podcast for that matter 
But you know what? I do it because it's meaningful and it gets me closer to my goal and it's aligned with my mission. It's aligned with where I want my life to go. So that's the difference there. I think sometimes we just overcomplicate what really needs to get done in our business, in our life to move the needle forward. And it's really easy to get stuck in that place. I don't know about you, but I've seen way too many people get stuck in the planning, the visioning, the strategizing phases, and they never take action. Because they cannot make a plan that is perfect enough that they know will work, so they just don't even get started. And that kind of brings us back to our experiments. You've heard me talk about lifestyle experiments, and you always have to run experiments. Some things that you try, when you take action, they don't work. Sometimes they do. So just being able to be okay with that, but you, guess what? You are never going to know if that action is going to work or not unless you take action. Action. If you don't actually do anything, if you sit there on the sidelines just thinking about it or drawing a vision board or, you know, writing the perfect strategy or taking courses and classes about planning for your business or career, are you actually doing what's going to get you there? Yes, that work is important, but to a point. I think you need to have enough clarity and enough vision to actually take action. And as soon as you have enough, that's when you stop planning. And the trap is that we get stuck in the planning, the visioning, like keep going on that because then we don't have to do the actual work, right? Because we're planning, we're thinking about it. It's fantastic. Like we get to live in our imagination, but we are, are not living in the now. So there needs to be a balance of the planning, the visioning, and the actual doing. And there's a concept that is called the minimum viable product, so the MVP. And I think a lot of like startups and technology brands and such use this approach to when they are building a product. So if they are creating an app, what they will do is they will make the minimum viable product. Minimum, I can never say it. MVP. And then they will ship it. They will get some beta testers. The beta testers will tell them, this is great. This sucks. You need to fix this. And then they will fix the things and then ship it again. And it's always going through this evolution and this process. We know because we're always asked to update apps that we use on a regular basis because they are continuing to ship. They are continuing to make changes in real time based on feedback they are getting. Are they waiting until they have the perfect app to ship? No, because they'd be waiting forever. And you never know what actually needs to be fixed until you have real users trying it. So taking the same approach to minimum viable product, what is good enough to put out there. If it is good enough to put out there, then you ship it. And this is something that I learned during Seth Godin's Alt MBA program. I went through it in 2016. I still, I'm looking at it right now. I still have the medallion from going through the program. It's like six years ago. Amazing. Really good program. So he's still offering it if you want to check it out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but what we learned during that cohort, I was in Alt MBA 6, if you're curious, was to ship a project before it was perfect. This was one of the game-changing concepts for me because I'm a perfectionist. Aren't many of us perfectionists? We want it to be 100%. We want it to be the most awesome thing ever. We don't want to release anything until it's going to blow everybody's minds. But guess what? You're never going to blow anyone's minds if you don't ship anything. And so you have to get comfortable with putting things out there that are not as perfect as you want them to be. And that is a process. And you have to build that slowly. You're not going to put out a piece of crap and <laughs> expect to feel wonderful about it. Like, I just put out a piece of crap. Yay, that's the first piece of crap I've ever put out. No, you have to actually build that muscle of shipping projects, shipping things before they are 100%. Does this mean you are cutting corners? No, it doesn't mean you're cutting corners. If you are doing shoddy work, that's one thing. But if you are doing the best you can in the time you have allotted and it is appropriate for that project, then you ship it. And you can say, I, I can fix that later. I can make edits. I can come back to it. So that is really, really key. You're cutting the fluff. You're shipping. You're putting out that minimum viable product. And when we try to artificially fluff things up in lieu of doing that actual work, we can get caught up in the minutia and it can pull us completely off track. And we never actually make that progress or take action on what needs to get done next. So many times doing a project and actually putting it out there, getting that feedback, it gives you exactly what you need to move forward and to make it better. So an example from my own life over the last year, I have been shipping a program that is called the LinkedIn Accelerator. The first time I launched it was in August of 2021. Since that time, I have launched it a total of five times. 
Every single time I have launched it, I have learned something. I've learned something about the launch process. I have learned something about my members. I have learned something about the content. I have learned something about the experience and how I can make it better. At the beginning, I was inundating people with way too much information. And they're like, Mindy, I'm drowning. This is all really good stuff, but, you know, please slow it down. I want a little more interaction with you. So then the next iteration of the accelerator was like, okay, let's build in some breathing room. So let me do three days of teaching and two days that are a little bit more coaching and in action and asking questions so you can actually absorb the material. And every single time that I run it, I learn something. I get to work with a new type of person or a new type of objective. You know, there's so many benefits to shipping it. And is it perfect yet? Oh, no, it is not. Uh, the last cohort that I had, I'm just being real here. They really wanted a lot more about not just their LinkedIn profile, but about social selling in general. And so it really got me thinking, okay, okay, I hear you. You really want to get leads on LinkedIn. Making your profile awesome is not good enough, even though you kind of have to do that to get leads. So what I need to do this next time around is really think through how I'm approaching the selling process and how am I positioning my product so that it makes sense to people who want to get leads. You know, and then make sure that I'm teaching enough inside the cohort so that they feel like they can leave that cohort and in five days feel like they can actually get leads on LinkedIn. You know, so every single iteration of a program, of a product is learning. And there's a little story that I have my my son, too. He is six. He is very, very e emotional. I would say at some points he expresses his emotions quite well and accurately, uh, whether you like them or not. And it was really funny because we just got a PlayStation 5 and he was playing, you know, and it's his first time. Like he does not know how to use the controller, what buttons do what. And so he's sitting there. And a few few days ago he had tried and he just got so frustrated. He's like, I keep dying. This is not fun. And he would just like throw the controller. We're like, don't, don't throw the controller, please. But this day it was really interesting because he's doing it and he goes, he died. And I was waiting for the blow up and he goes, I'm learning, <laughs> puts his hands up in the air. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? And he said, I'm learning. Every time I die, I learn what not to do. And that stuck with me. I wrote it down because it was so powerful. And so it's so funny. It's kind of the family joke now. Whenever he's playing that game, we'll come out there and he's like, I'm learning. I'm learning. And I'm like, yep, that means he just died in the game. And he learned what that character or that movement does. And when we take that same approach to how we live our lives, how we run our businesses, how we grow as humans, it's all learning. Like, Get rid of the fluff, focus on the learning points, and if you mess up, you take action and it was a little too messy, then try again. It's okay. We're learning. So I think it really comes back to thinking through your days. First of all, start with your days. Think through your days. Are there things and fluffy things or things that irritate you, that nag you, that you think are unnecessary? Is there a way to streamline them or cut them out? Then what are you shipping? What are you putting out there? Even if you're a little bit afraid that it's not perfect enough, what are you shipping this week? What are you shipping today? What are you sending? To me, it's really, really important. I learned this concept from a very wise man that I have worked with on a number of projects. And he taught me this a few years ago. And he goes, Mindy, when you're working with clients, especially one-on-one -on -one, from an agency perspective, the most important thing, he said, is if you are working on a project, you're touching them every single day. Or, you know, a couple times a week, depending on the project, but you're not dumping on them. So you're not sending them like 50 things to review. You're sending them one thing. And so every single day you're shipping every single day. You're letting them know, hey, I'm thinking of you today and I worked on this. What do you think of this? You know, of course, don't annoy your clients if that doesn't work with you. If your clients don't want to hear from you every day, that's fine. But I think it's that concept of shipping every day. And when you get into the habit of shipping important things every single day, it's amazing how that all adds up over time. Pretty soon, before you know it, you are your side hustle has turned into like a full-fledged business and you have to leave your nine to five. Or you are in a life that you're like, eh, it's okay, but it really could be better. And pretty soon you're like moving into your dream home. You're like, how did I get here? I'm financially feeling good. I'm financially free. I have more time. I, I can spend more quality time with my kids and my friends and my family. But that's because you got rid of the fluff. 
That's because you shipped things that were not perfect. That's because you actually took action on what you need to do next. And so if you're in that phase where it's like you feel like you're spinning your wheels, that was me. I, I, I felt like that multiple times over the past few weeks where it's like I'm spinning my wheels. I'm trying this. I'm trying that. Ooh, this actually hit really well. I wasn't expecting that to hit. And you're playing this game. It's almost like spinning plates, you know, where you're kind of are juggling. For those of you who can juggle, I cannot juggle. But you're trying to kind of figure out what's working and where to lean in and what is not working and where you should put your energy. Once you learn that, like once you learn that for yourself, for your business, for your life, for your health, for your relationships, it becomes easier because then you cut the other stuff out and you lean into the things that are working. But it's going to take some trial and error. If you're juggling, you're going to drop at some point. You're not going to always successfully juggle. I don't know exactly how to use that term, but that's fine. Um, so why do we overcomplicate things? Like when, like when you pay attention to overcomplicating things or overthinking, there was a really good book, actually, side note, that I listened to lately. Actually, I read it on, on Kindle. Sometimes I listen to them, but it's called Soundtracks by John Acuff. Fantastic book. If you are an overthinker, it goes really well with the topic today. If you tend to like have soundtracks playing over and over in your head and you overcomplicate things and you get stuck in a loop, that book is really good. And like basically the premise of the book, for those of you who don't want to read it, is positive affirmations. So basically you identify the negative soundtracks that play in your head and you replace them with positive soundtracks that you want to hear in your head that you want to say every single day. And so I thought it was a whole book about I'm like positive mantras. Okay. Why not? I'm already doing a gratitude journal every day. Why not make sure I have my positive mantras in there too? So it's a really, really good book if you want to go deeper, but basically positive mantras and saying things because when you say them, you actually believe them and we're training our brain to think positively, and also in the direction that we want to go. All right, so when do you overcomplicate things? You know, think about that for a minute. Like, is there something I'm overcomplicating right now? Is there a way that I could streamline it, either get rid of it? Well, I think I've heard this term, delete, automate, delegate, dad. You know, so can you delete it, automate it, delegate it, something? Or how do you feel with the task that feels too fluffy? Like, what do you do in that situation? Do you cut it out? Do you try to streamline it? Uh, do you just say, I'm going to do it anyways? Like, think through how you deal with tasks that just feel like a complete waste of time. And then are you able to ship things before they're perfect? You know, these are some really good questions just to journal on if you're a journaler or if you'd like to just think about them. Sometimes I like to listen and just think like, oh, those are really good questions. Sometimes I will write them down, too, and just let my brain work on it. But I would be very curious to hear your answers to any of those questions. Like, let's have a conversation. I love the DMs on Instagram to talk about these things. So shoot me a DM on Instagram. It's at Mango Effect Podcast if you'd like to chat about it. And then let's encourage and inspire each other this week. And let's ship some thing like tell me you know shoot me a dm on instagram saying mindy i shipped this like i would love to hear what you're shipping this week and if you tell me what you ship i will respond and tell you what i shipped this week too so that what should be very very fun all right if you like what you hear please subscribe to the mango effect podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode i'd be absolutely thrilled also if you could write a five-star review for the show if you love it many of you have been doing that and i appreciate it so much so thank you for all of the reviews and subscribes because they definitely will help us as we grow all right i will talk with you in the next episode have a beautiful rest of your day bye for now